All right, so we continue our study of the book of Acts. I'm going to encourage you to find a Bible and open with me to Acts chapter 4. And uh, our passage this morning will cover verses 23 through 31. Acts chapter 4, 23 through 31. And as you get there uh, in the Bible, let's pause and let's ask for the Lord's help and blessing over our time together. Father God, your word is holy, your word is true, your word is sufficient to equip us and furnish us with everything that's necessary for the life of godliness. Your word, Lord, pierces us to the core of who we are. It is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword. And so, Father, we're praying for your Holy Spirit. To come now and place your word upon our hearts and to do so in a way that's transformational, do so in a way that's convicting us of guilt, but also, Lord, encouraging us in truth and, Lord, granting us an understanding of, of how we ought to live. Lord, I, we pray that your spirit, Lord, would reinforce the gospel of Jesus Christ as a result of our time in your word this morning, that you would get the praise. We pray this in Jesus' name. All right, reading from the book of Acts, we're in chapter 4, verses 23 through 31. This is what Luke writes. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said, By the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city, they were gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness, while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. For those who are here to hear, let them hear the truth of God's word. How would you answer if I asked you what is the purpose of prayer? What do you think? What is the purpose of prayer? I think. We would all say prayer is important for Christians. Anybody disagree? No. Okay, I don't think so. Okay, are, are, we say it's important. I think everybody would say it's essential for us as believers. And so let me ask you a question. Who here is satisfied with the condition of their prayer life? Anybody? Um, anyone feel that you're at peak levels of praying right now? Anyone believing it could stand for some improvement, my brother? Anybody, anybody feel that way? Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. I, I would imagine we all feel in that last category, right? One of the reasons we fail to give prayer the place of importance and significance we, we should give it is because we often fail to recognize the spiritual battle that's around us. We use the word spiritual warfare because the Bible describes a spiritual battle between God's people and Satan and his forces. It has raging all around us, and we talk about this spiritual warfare, but so often we as believers, I think, kind of get a little sleepy, and we kind of minimize this battle, the spiritual forces that is happening all around us. So I think I've shared this with you before, but I'm going to share it again to help frame our thinking on prayer. John Piper addresses our failure to pray 
in light of the battle that's happening around us. And he writes this, the number one reason why prayer malfunctions in the hands of believers is that they try to turn a wartime walkie-talkie into a domestic intercom. What does he mean by that? Well, he continues on. And this is a long quote, but bear with me. I think what he says is really important. He says, prayer is for the accomplishment of a wartime mission. It is as though the field commander, Jesus, called in the troops, gave them a crucial mission, go and bear fruit, handed each of them a personal transmitter coded to the frequency of the general's headquarters, and said, comrades, the general has a mission for you. He aims to see it accomplished. And to that end, he has authorized me to give each of you personal access to him through these transmitters. If you stay true to his mission and seek his victory first, he will always be as close as your transmitter to give you tactical advice and to send in air cover when you or your comrades need it. But here's Piper's conclusion. But what have millions of Christians done? They have stopped believing that we are in a war. No urgency, no watching, no vigilance, no strategic planning, just easy peacetime and prosperity. And what did they do with the walkie-talkie? They tried to rig it up as an intercom in their cushy houses and cabins and boats and cars. Not to call in firepower for conflict with a mortal enemy, but to ask the maid to bring another pillow to the dead. Boy, that, that cuts to the heart, doesn't it? Piper's overstating the reality of the spiritual warfare that we are all involved in, and it's emphasizing the importance of prayer. We see it in our text, don't you? Don't you see it? They're facing this opposition from the Sanhedrin. They're threatened to never preach the gospel again. Peter and John were just arrested. They boldly told the Sanhedrin they healed in the power and name of Jesus Christ, and the Sanhedrin said, don't say his name anymore. Don't talk about him. Don't teach about him. You're not allowed to talk about him anymore. And what did Peter and John say? He says, they, you, they said, you need to judge what's right here, whether we obey God or whether we obey you. We are going to obey God because we can't help but talk about what we have seen and what we've heard. We can't help but tell others about Jesus and what he has done. So the Sanhedrin threatened Peter and John. Peter and John said, well, we're still going to do it. And what did the Sanhedrin do after that? They threatened them some more. Right? Threatened them some more. And so Peter and John just demonstrate this incredible boldness as they stood on trial before the high court of Israel. And now they get set free. And what are they going to do once they are set free? Well, they go back to the church. And they pray. They go back to the church and they pray. And remember, they didn't have a church building at this point. The church is not a building. The church is a people. In fact, I love how Luke says it. They went back to their own. They went back to their own and they prayed. And so our text teaches that confronted with opposition, God's people persevere by prayer. Confronted with opposition, God's people persevere by prayer. They survive by prayer. They cling to God by prayer. They rely upon prayer. That's what they're doing in the midst and in the face of opposition to Christ and the gospel. And so there's an urgency here in how they're praying. And we're going to say three characteristics of the church's prayer. Three characteristics of the church's prayer. And the first characteristic of their prayer is we see that they were comforted by God's sovereignty. Comforted by God's sovereignty. So take a look at verse 23. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and elders had said to them. So Peter and John are released. The Sanhedrin gave them a permanent gospel gag order. Right? Don't talk about Jesus anymore or else. That's what they get. 
So they get out of their custody and they immediately go to their friends, the ESV says, but literally, as I mentioned before, Luke writes, they went to their own. They, they went to their own. And it's a beautiful description of fellow believers, isn't it? They went to their own. It's a picture of true fellowship, true koinonia. They belonged to each other. They had a share in Christ and a share in each other. They belonged to one another. As they were connected to Jesus, they are connected to each other. So it was only natural for Peter and John, after getting out of custody, to go to their own people, to the church. And they give a report of what happened at the Sanhedrin. And, and they said, well, here's what the chief priest, the elders told us, stop talking about Jesus. Right? They charged them. They chart. It wasn't like, hey guys, I want you to consider stop talking about this, this man. Right? No, no, no. They were charged by the high court of Israel, don't talk or teach or preach about Jesus of Nazareth. Stop it. So how does the church respond when given those kind of charges? What does the church do? And this is so instructional for us, isn't it? Their instinct to hearing this news is to pray. Their instinct is to pray. There is powerful opposition to the gospel, so they pray. They get out the walkie-talkies. Right? They, they command to God. They, they speak to God. Look at verse 24. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. So there's a lot we can learn here from this. The church, this group of people, they did not have political power. They, they're not starting a grassroots political campaign here. They don't have influence. That's not what they're dealing with. Okay, They're up against the most powerful court in Israel who just charged them to be quiet and just threatened them repeatedly to not talk about Jesus anymore. And what do they do with no power of, against lots of power? They pray because they realize in prayer, while they don't have power, they don't have influence, they have direct access to the God who rules the universe, right? They have direct access to the God who's in control, who's sovereign over everything. And we're going to see that by dissecting their prayer, how soon do they start asking for stuff? How soon? It, it, they wait, don't they? they? They don't rush to their petitions. They don't rush to their requests. Instead, they first pause and reflect upon God's sovereignty. God's sovereignty. That's a big word. What does sovereignty mean? We need to define our biblical words, right? What, what is sovereignty? It means God is in control. And some people like God's sovereignty, some, but they don't like it too much. Like We like God being... A little sovereign, but not too sovereign. But sovereignty in itself, there's no way you can be a little sovereign, right? Either you're sovereign completely or you're not sovereign. Amen. And the scriptures confirm that God is sovereign over everything. He is, he is in control of everything in this world. And so just look at how they address God. What do they call him? My translation is sovereign Lord. Not all our English translations use sovereign Lord. Many do. The Greek word that's used here to address God is despotes. Despotes. It's actually where we get the word despot from, right? And that's usually not a friendly picture that we think of that somebody being a despot. Usually it's a very negative connotation. But here, that word literally means master or owner. It describes somebody who has legal control and authority over persons. It describes a ruler who has unchallengeable and often when we think of despots, they're corrupt and they're wicked and they use their power for evil. And that's what sets God apart because he has power that's unchallengeable, but he's good at his being. And so think about this. God reveals truth about himself in scripture through different names and different titles. You can start thinking about the different names of God, right? And those names reveal a different aspect of who he is. So what is the significance here that when the church begins praying that they address him as sovereign Lord? What, what are they doing here? They're praising God for his who he is. He is sovereign Lord, but also they are, aren't they encouraging themselves? 
by reminding themselves that the God they're approaching is greater than the Sanhedrin. The God that they're approaching is Lord of all, right? Uh, of all the world can be against us. Satan and all of his forces can be against us. But if the sovereign Lord is for you, who can really ever be against you? Isn't that the idea here? And, and the, this reminder of God's sovereignty is not just found in how they address God. Keep reading the prayer. Verse 24. You who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. So they're confessing God is who? Creator, right? He is creator. And again, they're still not to the request yet. They're not rushing to the request or the petitions. They are lingering in adoration. They're remembering who God is. He's the creator. He made everything. Why is that important? Well, the one who created everything is by definition Lord of everything. If you create it, you own it. If you created it, it belongs to you. And so why are they starting this prayer this way? Again, it's simultaneously praising God for who he is, but it's comforting them. Because they have these powerful men threatening them. And they need to remind themselves of who their God is. And that's what they're doing here. They are approaching one who is far greater than their opposition. And they're comforted in God's power as creator and Lord. But what do they do next in the prayer? This is, this is really helpful for us, right? They quote scripture. You see it? They quote scripture. They actually quote Psalm 2. To remind themselves and to say back to God that he is in control of everything. Look at 25 and 26. Who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. So, first thing you need to do and notice here. In verse 25 is they're affirming the divine inspiration of scripture you see that god spoke through david's mouth and david spoke by the holy spirit so this is true of all of the bible all of the scriptures the holy spirit speaks through fallen men right and that's why we hold that the bible is truly and completely the word of God, even though it's coming from flawed men like David. Okay? It's truly God's word. The Holy Spirit spoke through him. And so they quote Psalm 2, verses 1 and 2, which was considered to be a messianic psalm. And why are they quoting this to God? Right? Psalm 2 specifically mentions the nations, the kings, the rulers, taking counsel together against Yahweh, and against his anointed. Who's his anointed? Pop quiz. What's the Hebrew word for anointed? Let me say Messiah. Messiah. And the Greek word for anointed, or Greek word for Messiah, is Christ, right? It wasn't his last name, it's his title. He was the Christ, the anointed one. And here, they're quoting Psalm 2, which says about God predicted, God prophesied that these rulers and these kings and these nations would be opposed to God and opposed to his Christ, opposed to his Messiah. Did that happen in history? Oh, absolutely. Did look at verses 27 and 28. For truly in this city, there, there were, they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, when was he anointed? Remember his baptism, he's anointed with the Holy Spirit publicly, right? So whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan have predestined to take place. So the believers here, as they're praying, they're recognizing that right there in Jerusalem, this all happened. Psalm 2 was fulfilled, that we had the rulers gathered together against Jesus, God's holy servant. And he goes and mentions names. There's the Jewish ruler Herod. There's the Gentile ruler Pilate. And then he includes Israel and the Gentiles. So it was not just one group of people responsible for killing Jesus. It wasn't just the Jews. It wasn't just the Gentiles. Everyone was represented 
in the killing of the Messiah. Okay, we need to understand that. And because everyone is represented in the killing of the Messiah, everyone is accountable for the killing of the Messiah. Yeah, what does the church affirm? Look at verse 28. All those people who did what they did were carrying out God's plan. Did you see it? They, they, they did what God's hand predestined to take place. And I love this because we've seen this a few times in the book of Acts already. We have an unambiguous statement that humans are responsible for their actions, yet God is still sovereign over their actions. Right? And so by quoting Psalm 2, the, the church is saying these rulers oppose God in vain. They, they opposed him in vain, first of all, because God's stronger than them. Right? And also, they opposed him in vain because he's able to use their own evil plans, hijack them, and redeem them for his purposes to accomplish his will. I mean, how frustrating is it when you intend to oppose someone and they use you, they, your own opposition for their good? All right? Isn't that, wouldn't that be frustrating? And that's what God does. He can't be confounded. Satan and his followers are playing checkers. God is playing 4D chess. Okay? It's not a fair match. He's taking what their plans, their, their evil plans, and he's going to use them for his ultimate purpose. And so, yes, the, the wicked hearts of Herod and Pilate and the Jews and the Gentiles are responsible for putting Jesus to death. And God is going to use that death to redeem sinners and ultimately to pay the price for our salvation. So a couple quick takeaways from this first point. Number one, we should pray the Bible. We should pray the Bible. It is no small thing that these Christians are quoting Scripture back to God. Why are they doing that? You ever stop and wonder? Do, you, do they think God forgot about Psalm 2? They like, oh, I forgot to put that in there. Do you, you think that they thought God had forgot what's in his word? Why would they use Scripture in prayer? Using the scriptures, when we pray the Bible, it gives us guardrails for our prayers, right? Praying the Bible gives us confidence and assurance for our requests. And so the scriptures direct our hearts and our minds about what we should be praying about. So I would tell you a great habit to get into. When you go to God in prayer, have your Bible in your hand, open it up, and use the Bible to direct your praying. Okay? You ever have a problem where you think, oh, gee, I, I get lost in prayer, I pray for like a minute, and then I'm like drifting off. You know what keeps you from getting lost in prayer? When you're praying the Bible. And it's helpful. I'm encouraging you to do that. Second takeaway here from this first point we should see. God's sovereignty should foster prayer. God's sovereignty should encourage prayer. Have you ever had somebody complain about God's sovereignty? And they, they say something like this. Well, if God is sovereign, why should I bother praying? He's going to do what he wants to do anyway. You ever have anything to say that? I had somebody fairly recently ask me that question sincerely. I don't, they, they told me, I, don't, I, don't, I struggle to pray because I know God's going to do what he wants anyhow. What good is it? So what's the answer to that? If God is sovereign, why should we pray? If he's in control of everything, why should we do that? And the answer is, it's because God is sovereign. That's precisely why we should pray. And so you look at the church here in Acts, they are allowing God's sovereignty to do what? Drive them to prayer. But also they're finding God's sovereignty a tremendous source of comfort in the midst of their opposition. Prayer would be pointless if God wasn't sovereign. There would be no reason that you should pray if God's not in control of everything. Why would you approach and ask God to help if he has no power to help you? Go write in a journal somewhere. But if God is sovereign, go talk to him because he's almighty. He can do whatever pleases him. And his sovereignty is precisely the reason we should be praying. And it should not be a deterrent to our prayers, but a fire to light our prayers. And so we see how God's sovereignty is comforting the believers in their praying. A second characteristic of their prayer is that it's focused on God's mission. It's focused on God's mission. 
After starting with praise and adoration, again, a little prayer tip, I would encourage you, start your prayers with praise and adoration. I think it's a helpful way to start praying, right? Start by praising God for who he is, okay? So after starting with praise and adoration, now they come to their request. And what they ask for is really telling, isn't it? Because what are they asking for? Their first request to God is to look upon their threat. Look upon their threats. Look at the first part of verse 29. And now, Lord, look upon their threats. Now, what exactly are they asking God to do here? Doesn't God already see everything? Doesn't God already know everything? He, he, he knows everything. So why are the believers saying, God, look upon their threats? Some translations say consider here. The word has the idea of take note of. To regard with attention. Okay? And I found this request fascinating because they, they're they not asking God, judge our enemies. Are they doing that? Are they saying, God, punish them for what they did to us? That's not what they're doing. They simply go to God and ask him, take note of what they're saying to us. Right? Take note of what they're saying to us. The more I thought about this first request, the more impressed I was by it, because this is really a request of faith. They are simply beseeching God to consider the threats that are against them. And the implication is they're asking him to do what he deems best. That he deems best for them. Right? They, they're not prescribing actions for God to do against these people. They're just saying, hey, uh, God, please take note of this. And, and and I believe the, the implication is we trust with whatever you decide. Right? It's your will be done, not our will be done. And, and so they're not looking for punishment for their enemies, or judgment for their enemies, or payback for their enemies. They're trusting God. Handle it. Lord, handle it. You, you just look upon it. Right? You know what's best. But what is their next request? Look at verse 29. And now, Lord, look upon their threats. And grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. And again, this is, I think, kind of a surprising request because um, I don't know about you, but I know I'm guilty of this often. My instinct in prayer is, Lord, protect us. Keep us safe. Put a hedge of protection. What's a hedge of protection? You ever thought of anything about that? Put a hedge of protection around us, right? And we would expect the church to pray in a similar way, but clearly protection and security is not foremost in their minds. At least that's not what they're praying about. They are just threatened not to preach or teach about Jesus anymore, and they're not asking God for protection and safety? What's wrong with this? What's wrong with this? Instead, what are they asking for? Give us more boldness. Give us boldness to meet the opposition that we're going to face. Remember the Sanhedrin was taken back by Peter and John's boldness. Remember that? Because they were untrained. They, 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 were, they, they were not in the formal rabbinical school. And so they pray for continued boldness. Now, do you know what this request tells me? First of all, this request tells me that Peter and John were keenly aware that their boldness that they just exhibited before the Sanhedrin was not their own. Right? This request tells me that they knew it was not their strength, it was not their power, it was not their wisdom that enabled them to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Sanhedrin. Because if they believed it was all them, they would not be asking for more of it. They knew it was God who supplied them with boldness, that his spirit had emboldened them. And they also knew that if they were going to continue to be faithful witnesses for Jesus, they needed more boldness from God. They did not fall into the trap we often fall into when God empowers us or gives us gifts for his service that we start reading our own press clippings. That we start thinking we had something to do with it. Right? 
may we never begin to think that we are something in ourselves. May we never begin to think that we have something that we weren't first given. But may I never stand up here preaching, thinking that I'm just inherently able to do this. Because I, I guess word for you, I can't. Okay? They just spoke boldly before the Sanhedrin, and they knew that was a boldness that was on loan to them from God. And they know that even though they were bold in one defense of the gospel, that did not guarantee they would be bold the next time. And that if they were going to be bold the next time, they needed to depend on God in prayer. And our problem is we begin to take for granted God's gifts and his talents and his strength and his, what he gives to us. And when the next time comes, we coast on our own abilities and then we fall flat on our faces. And we fail to rely and depend on God in prayer. They were bold one time. That's no guarantee they're going to be bold the next time. They knew they were dependent on God. Brothers and sisters, we need the same reliance every day. We need to know that if we're going to be faithful in representing Jesus in his mission to this world, we are reliant and dependent upon God's strength and his power. We cannot do it on our own. And by the way, that should foster prayer in our lives. Also, I want you to notice the heart of their request. The heart of their request is focused on what? As I pointed out, it's not on their own safety. The heart of their request was focused on mission. It was on spreading the gospel of Jesus. And, and there's a third request that's connected with the second one, where they petition God for boldness, but then they also ask that he would continue to work wonders through the name of Jesus. Okay? Look at verse 30. While you stretch out your hand to heal, and signs of wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. So they're not taking credit for that healing. They just ask for boldness to keep preaching the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they're asking God, continue to use them to heal in Jesus' name and his power. Remember that these miracles, these signs and their wonders were serving to confirm the message of the gospel. The miracles and the signs were confirming the message of the gospel. The signs and the wonders were in service to the preaching of the truth of the gospel, not vice versa, okay? They were not preaching in order to say, hey, let's get an audience Let's preach this, get an audience so that we can do miracles. Right? It's the other way around. The miracles were gathering the crowd so they could preach. Because the emphasis is on the proclaiming of the truth of Jesus. That he died on the cross for our sins. That he was raised from the dead. And that all those who turn from their sins and embrace him by faith will be saved. The signs, the wonders, they're the hand servants of the gospel. And gathering that message was ultimately the most important thing. And so their requests tell us a lot, because their requests tell us what they're most concerned about. And what are they most concerned about? Spreading the gospel, right? Spreading the gospel. Everything else can take a back seat. Now, now, you need to hear me say up here, you can pray about anything, okay? Um, there's no issue too big for you to pray about, no issue too small for you to pray about. We are told to cast all of our cares and anxieties upon the Lord because he cares for us. Okay? So don't think for a second I'm up here telling you you should not pray for safety. Don't be praying for hedges. Don't be praying. Yeah, I'm not saying that. Okay? I want you to hear. I'm not saying that. If you're concerned about something, you better be praying about it. Pray about it. God knows your heart. But at the same time, we can and should learn something from the priority of the church's prayer here in the midst of opposition. And their priority was not their safety. Their priority was the preaching of the gospel. That's what they were most concerned about. They're casting their cares on the Lord, and their cares were centered on spreading the good news. And so we should learn from their priority and their focus about the, the, the priority of the gospel and how that must take center 
place in our hearts and lives. This takes us to a third characteristic of the church's prayer, and that is it was supplied with God's strength. Supplied with God's strength. Take a look at verse 31. I love this. When they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Now, now this is awesome, okay? After they prayed, the, their, the place, the house, where they are in Jerusalem starts shaking. It appears to be a localized earthquake, right? Localized to the location where the church is. The place where they were gathered was shaken. Now, why was the place shaken after they prayed? This was a physical and tangible response by God that he heard their prayer. Now, be honest. Wouldn't this be awesome? <laughs> you can imagine every time you pray. Now, I'm not talking about anything severe, like no seven point whatever. Earthquake. It wouldn't be awesome that you, you say amen, there's a little rattling of the windows, and you're like, all right, God, good. <laughs> Who would all love that? That's not normative. I think we know that. Uh, we should not expect that. That's not usual. But this church, these young believers, were in a very vulnerable position in their defense of the gospel, needed this encouragement from the Lord. And while I say that this is not normal, there have been many times in my own life when I prayed something and there has been an instant answer. And it was unmistakable and un unambiguous. That's not normal. I'm not saying you should always expect it. But maybe you've experienced that too, where you prayed something and the, the answer came immediately. God still hears all of our prayers, and he still answers our prayers. But remember what Jesus said, keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. And he, one of the things he continuously teaches about prayers is we should not expect immediate answers. He, he, that's why, you know, the story of the man bothering his neighbor in the middle of the night, you know, give us some bread, we have guests coming, right? And Jesus, not because he liked his neighbor, it's because he wanted him to go to bed, right? He wanted to go back to sleep, so he gave. He encourages us, don't expect to get immediate answers, okay? Keep going, keep asking, keep seeking. But sometimes God does. He does. And so, church father John Chrysostom remarked about this. He says, the place was shaken, and that made them all the more unshaken. Some commentators point out that this is like a reenactment of Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit. The place is shaken, and Luke said they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they continued to speak the word of God with boldness. So, I, I, we need to talk about being filled with the Holy Spirit, all right? We need to be careful to understand what that means, what that doesn't mean. So, here's a pop quiz for you. Can believers be filled with the Holy Spirit more than one time? Can believers be filled with the Holy Spirit more than one time? What do you think? Yes, yes, we can. We saw in Acts the believers were already filled with the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, right? We saw Peter speak before the Sanhedrin, and Luke says he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And here we have a, a refilling of the Spirit. So we must not confuse being filled with the Holy Spirit with being sealed by the Holy Spirit, okay? Being sealed by the Holy Spirit is a one-time thing. When the Spirit regenerates our hearts and changes out our heart of stone for a heart of flesh, He indwells us and He seals us as proof that we belong to God. That's a one-time deal. But being filled by the Holy Spirit is different. That happens many times over the course of our Christian lives. We as Christians live our Christian lives in various, under various in levels of influence of the Holy Spirit. Did you know that? That's why the scriptures tell us that we can quench the Holy Spirit. We can grieve the Holy Spirit. How do we do that? When we're living in sinful rebellion to God and his law and commands, right? So we can just quench the Spirit of life, but also there are times when we are filled by the Holy Spirit. And this is when the Spirit's at work in us in a powerful way. And that's why you have up and down in Christian life. You ever notice that? Sometimes you're really hot for the Lord to say. Sometimes I feel cold. Right? 
And, and I, I would just maybe say, the time you're feeling hot, hot for the Lord, very well maybe it's times when you're filled with the Holy Spirit. Right? Versus times when we quench or grieve Him. And so, what it, does it mean to be filled by the Spirit? This is something I've been trying to hammer home throughout our study of the Gospel, or the Gospel, the Book of Acts, and the sure sign that somebody is filled by the Spirit is that they're bearing witness to Jesus. They're bearing faithful witness to Jesus through their words, through their lives, through their actions, right? So when the Spirit comes and fills believers, they're going off and they're bearing witness to Jesus. And Luke is telling us something really, really important here. Because the believers are not just randomly filled with the Spirit here, are they? Is this just random? That, you know, they're walking down the street and God's like, bam, Holy Spirit, you got full, this is the full force now, go ahead. Is that what happens? What's precipitating this? Are they just automatically filled with the Spirit? What were they doing that brought this on? They're praying. They're praying. Commentator Craig Keener picks up the theme in both Luke and Acts. He says, as elsewhere in Luke and Acts, prayer invites the coming of the Spirit. Luke is showing us that the filling of the Spirit came as a direct result of the church's prayer. You would have to venture to guess that if they weren't praying about this, they wouldn't be filled by the Spirit in the way that they are because of their prayers. John Piper, again, is helpful here. He says, this is very relevant for us because it shows us how we should be seeking the power of God's Spirit. We should be praying for it like they were. And remember, Jesus says not to lose heart, but to keep seeking and knocking and asking the Father for the Holy Spirit. That's why we read Luke chapter 11 earlier in the service. It's a key text. Because Jesus is encouraging his followers to pray, right? And what does he say at the very end of that text? He encourages us to pray, knowing that God is a loving Father, unlike us who are evil. I love that part, right? He's like, you guys are evil, and you still give good gifts to your kids, right? And so he says, God is a loving Father who's not evil, who's eager to give you good things. How much more will he give the Holy Spirit to those who will ask? And so here's a question for us all this morning. Is this something you are regularly praying for? Are you praying regularly that God would fill you with the power of the Holy Spirit in order to bear witness to Jesus in your life? We should be praying for this every day. We should be praying that God would fill us with his Spirit's power so that we could bear witness to Jesus. Because that's what's happening in Acts. When the church is filled with the Spirit, they are Bearing witness to Jesus Christ. That is our mission as well. To bear witness to Jesus, we can only do that with the power and, and, and influence of the Holy Spirit. We can't do that on our own. Not our own strength. So let me encourage you. Let me challenge you. Pray for this. Plead for this. Pray for God's Spirit to fill in you. So that you can bear witness to Jesus Christ. And so here's this beautiful model of prayer for us. It, it's a prayer which confesses God's power and it rests in God's power. I look back and say, why aren't they praying for safety and protection? You know why? Because they already affirmed the fact that God was in control of everything. And maybe they felt it was redundant to go and ask for safety and blessing when they already know who God is as the sovereign Lord. But also this is a prayer that confesses inadequacy. It confesses weakness. It's an example of how God provides his power. So every time you pray, it's a declaration of your dependence. The reason we pray is because we're not able to cope. We're not able to handle life. We're not able to live for Jesus on our own, in our own strength. The reason we pray is we're admitting our dependence and our need for God's help. And here again we see how God provides power for bold witness when the people are praying. So are we praying about this? Are we praying for the power of the Holy Spirit? I know that if God is going to work mightily through our church for the sake of the gospel, 
the people of the church need to be devoted to praying and praying for God's help to carry out his mission. We have to do that. We need to spend time in the presence of the Lord. And so I'm going to leave you with these words by a great preacher, the greatest preacher, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, on the power of prayer. And he says this, All hell is vanquished when the believer bows his knees in importunate supplication. Beloved brethren, let us pray. We cannot all argue, but we can all pray. We cannot all be leaders, but we, but we can all be pleaders. We cannot all be mighty in rhetoric, but we can all be prevalent in prayer. I would sooner see you eloquent with God than with men. Prayer links us with the eternal, the omnipotent, the infinite, and hence it is our chief resort. Be sure that you are with God, and then you may be sure that God is with you. Let's pray. Father God, we rejoice for this example of your church. Not perfect by any means, but Lord, we rejoice in their humble dependence on you in prayer and how you responded with the power of your spirit filling them up. And Father, I, I pray that you would grant us the faith here this morning to pray those kind of prayers that are ready and willing to confess your sovereignty and power and are begging for boldness and Lord, for you to be at work in our hearts and lives that we could be filled by your spirit to tell others about Jesus Christ. Father God, I pray that you would continually reform us according to your word, your will, and that, Lord, you would give us all a burden to pray for the pouring out of your Holy Spirit in our own lives, and that more and more we'll come to know Jesus as a result, that you would get the glory, we pray in Jesus' name.